He told me on the very first morning, they, the prospects, have all the answers. Your job is to ask them the right questions. So well, that is very rare for yeah. anybody to say. Yeah, one of the things I'm, I'm a huge fan of saying is never tell somebody something you can have them realize and articulate themselves. So I'm all about having honest conversations, killing elephants in the room as early as possible, yeah. dropping their defenses, giving them permission to tell you no. And when you do that, they don't see you as a threat anymore. They don't see you as a typical style person anymore. You can have tough skin and, and re you go through rejection. And I'm like sitting there looking at this stuff and I'm like, man, if I sold that way, I, I would have made like 95% less in my career. And I saw all these salespeople buy into that way of thinking. And I'm like, they're gonna burn out. As a result, sale or no sale, I feel good about the interaction because if they don't buy from me, I know exactly why they didn't buy from me. And more often than not, it's because the fit wasn't there for whatever reason. What's the biggest emotional driver in a human being that causes them to want to change? It's... All right, Jeremy Miner, welcome to another episode of Closers or Losers. Now, today we have a special guest, a salesperson and also a sales trainer who runs one-on-one -on -one training. I'm going to introduce this gentleman. Typically, when we when we do this podcast, all of you out there listening, if you're listening to us or if you're watching this on YouTube, as you know, typically each week we have usually a client from a different industry because I know that's what you want to hear, right? You want to hear like people that are in the trenches selling you know, one-to-one -one or one-to-many -to because that gives you skill level. That helps you make more money. Uh, you know, we always get pitched to have, you know, uh, you know, motivational people on here. And I love motivation, 100%. I've got some really good friends that are in personal development and, and do that, have great books. But I know you as a salesperson, you want to know what to say. You want to know what to ask the prospect. You want to know how to use your tone. You want to learn body language you want to learn skills that can help you sell more and that's why we do what we do so this week we 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 wanted to bring on a guest that is still in sales does exceptionally well and i'm going to read you his bio okay this is mr michael dunleavy uh, i actually follow him on facebook i saw some of his uh, posts and everything i'm not sure i started following you michael we'll talk about that in a second uh, but this gentleman has more than 20 years experience in sales. So he's not some, you know, one hit wonder that, you know, made a couple hundred grand one year and now he's a coach or something like that. We see that all the time in different industries. So he's got 20 years experience. He's sold in all sorts of industries. You're talking from, you know, liquor to, to fitness, to retail, to travel, tourism, you know, remote high ticket, builders, plumbers, electricians, business opportunities, coaching, masterminds, investment, all that stuff. He's also a creator and owner of multiple businesses over the past 15 years. So he's got that experience. He's still selling for one client today, a high-level mastermind program for elite entrepreneurs and CEOs. We'll talk about that in a second. I know a lot of you are entrepreneurs. You want to get into that space. And he's also now helping other salespeople uh, get to a much better place, but keeping it ethical, keeping it dignified, where you feel good uh, about your prospects, you feel good when you close a deal because the prospect feels good about it too. We're not talking about buy or die strategies because as you know, watching us here, those very rarely work unless you love playing the numbers game, grinding it out, getting burned out all the time. That doesn't sound very fun. I didn't like to do that when I was in sales either because you don't make that much money. You're capped. He's from Australia, but he's based in Guatemala, 17 years in county. He's got a wife and two kids. Michael, how are you? Jeremy, good to see you. That was a hell of an introduction. Thank you. You know, you know, we got we got to give our guests a good introduction. Uh, you know, one thing I like about you, I, I met you yesterday. I, I don't know you, but like I said, uh, somehow I saw some post on Facebook and I started feeling like, oh, you know, he's got some good things there that he's saying. So maybe we should have him on the show. So, Michael, give us kind of just a just an overview. You're in sales now. What do you actually sell? So I still work with one client. So I sell a mastermind for high level entrepreneurs and CEOs, uh, business owners. Uh, the guy that heads up the mastermind is a guy called Peter Diamantes, who's a quite a famous uh, entrepreneur, you know, business partner with Elon Musk, and one degree of separation from everybody in that world. Right. And it's amazing people that come together. Uh, you know, he's very much the um, the synthesizer or the leader or the chief inspirer, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. Brings amazing people together, and they're all there to become more extraordinary. So it's an amazing group to sell to. It's an amazing group to be a part of. I get to know Peter and his world, you know, closely. And 
I'm learning, I'm inspired. I'm seeing guys and girls further along than I am. And yeah, it's an old product to sell. Hey, you are, you know, the saying, I don't know who said it, you probably know, but you are who you associate yourself with is very, yep. very accurate, right? So that type of industry, when you sell those type of masterminds, it's not even just what you learn in, in those type of events, but it's it's the networking that you have there. It's like when you meet yep. this guy or this lady that runs this company, now you have access to even more successful people. You talk about the one degree of separation. It's 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 true. You're you're like literally like one degree away from you know knowing somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody, and then all of a sudden you're at the White House, you know, or something yep. like that, or you're meeting Elon Musk, you know, it, it's yep. close. Yeah, that's the world. I mean, the beauty of selling this product is whether or not it's a sale or not, I always leave the call inspired, having learned something, having made a new connection. Yeah. They add me on LinkedIn or I add them and yeah. I'm better for it regardless of the outcome. So it's an absolute dream. I mean, I've started at the other end where I sold things that weren't that much fun to sell. I right. didn't necessarily feel good if it wasn't a sale, but this is very much the other end of the spectrum. And then I wanted to talk to you about that because, you know, when we, you know, me and you talked for probably 40, 45 minutes yesterday about kind of the show and, and kind of our, you know, our community of salespeople and entrepreneurs and the different industries they come from. And, mm -hmm. you know, you you know a lot of things we have in common right so from what we talked about so but you know you're not born with those skills nobody's born with advanced questioning skills out of your mother's womb you're not born with advanced tonality skills or advanced objection prevention or handling skills you acquire those skills so let, let's talk about when you first got into sales how were you taught how to sell I was fortunate my first sales job was with jack daniels uh okay. 20 or so years ago jack and daniels really and was, I don't even drink oh that stuff gosh, anymore. Back, awesome. then, back then it was a little different. Yeah. But uh, on the very first morning of the first day on the job, my he was the manager. So he was my first coach or mentor or trainer, whatever you want to call it. He was my boss as well. Yeah. He told me on the very first morning, they, the prospects, have all the answers. Your job is to ask them the right questions. So that is very rare for yeah. anybody to say. So I learned the Socratic method on day one and mm. still day you know you asked me yesterday who were my five biggest influences and yeah. i didn't say socrates yesterday but i probably should have because the socratic method you know they have all the answers my job is to help them find it and discover it uh still underpins how i sell today so yeah. i was lucky i started there and then built on that um i was never taught from day one to stand in front of them and tell sell you know hold up the bottle of jack daniels and go look how amazing this is um it was never about the product it was always we're, about we're number one in the market Right. Well, we were, so it was it was advantageous, uh, but it was always about understanding where they were at, where they wanted to go, who they wanted to become, how they wanted to be seen, how they wanted to feel, what their limitations were, could they overcome them, you know, yeah. all those sorts of things. Yeah. And in the end, they took care of themselves, and then the sale came on the back of that. No, 100% for sure. And it's, it's interesting you brought up the Socratic method, because uh, when I went to college, I, st I majored in behavioral science and social dynamics, right? If you're familiar with that. So behavioral science, you actually study the Socratic method. So mm -hmm. that's one thing I'm actually very, very familiar with it. And part of NEPQ would have aspects of that for sure is getting the prospect to sell themselves. See, it's called self-persuasion, right? So if you study, you know, Socrates, if you even study Jesus Christ himself, you'll notice that they asked easy to answer questions mm -hmm. that allowed the listener prospects, if you want to call them or the public to basically question their way of thinking that allowed their situation or problems to keep happening, right? Mm -hmm. If you read the New Testament, even though you know it's been translated all different times, it's probably not 100% accurate. There's books of the Bible that are not even there. You're gonna notice that Christ asked easy to answer questions that allowed the people listening to think through and internalize what he was saying and asking. And that drives change. You know, as you know, what's the biggest emotional driver in a human being that causes them to want to change? It's pain or the fear of future pain. Mm -hmm. But for us to, we can't tell them that, right? Mm -hmm. as you know, it goes in one ear out the other. But our questioning ability, and especially how we use our tone, causes them to internalize, especially when we, you know, we'll talk about it, verbal pacing, pacing out the question, verbal pausing that causes them to internalize what you're asking uh, cause them to really think deeper. And that's really what Socrates really specialized in. I would say, even if you could tell them the answer, it's going to feel different uh, if it comes from them. They're going to take ownership of it. They're going to have come to that realization rather than having been convinced by you and therefore hold, hold you to account if it doesn't play out the way it, it should. Yeah. So 
you know, one of the things I'm I'm a huge fan of saying is never tell somebody something you can have them realize and articulate themselves. Yeah. And that comes via the Socratic method, by asking them questions so they discover the answer, articulate yeah. it, and then commit to it. And once they've committed to their new answer or their new position, yeah. well, then you can ask them, where do you want to go to from here? And often that leads them to realizing the best thing they can do is to ask to buy from you. Yeah. Uh, that is the appropriate next step. Which 100%. Hundred percent, yeah. In be- in behavioral science, you you learn that there's different forms of of communication, right? And, mm-hmm. and the highest form of persuasion is self persuasion. You know, they they technically they call that dialogue, right? When you study this credit method, they call that dialogue is getting the person to self actualize, right? Where they're at, what their real situation is, and compared to where they want to be. And you're hundred percent right when they self actualize that. And it's not like they just understand all that. It it might be buried in their subconscious, but your question ability and how you use your tone allows that to surface mm-hmm. where now it's right on the edge of their mind. They're like thinking about it all the time. And you're the only person that really has done that with mm-hmm. them. And, and mm-hmm. it causes them to view you, as you know, as more of an expert, more of the the trusted authority, the trusted expert, rather than, as you know, how most salespeople are viewed just, you know, another salesperson trying to stuff their solution down their throat and they commoditize you. So like you said, when it's their idea and mm-hmm. you help facilitate that by what mm-hmm. you ask them, mm-hmm. then it's true. Then they own it. And as you know, I'm going to go on a limb that when you make a sale, Michael, that I'm going to say that probably hardly anybody ever wants a refund. Very rarely. Be, okay. Very yeah. rarely. That's we, because. We, we talked about this yesterday. I mean, refunds often come as an outcome from you selling entirely based on emotion, uh, you know, hyper persuasion, even pressure, uh, even unsavory tactics, but it's not underpinned by a logical, you know, this makes sense and I can justify buying this because of ABC. It's yeah. just emotion and the emotion passes, you know, yeah. after the call is over or the moment has passed, rationale kicks in and like, oh my God, what did I just do? Yeah. Here comes the refund. Here comes the chargeback. Yeah. Here comes the first payment only, but not the next 12 after it. Yeah. I've no interest in being in those types of ecosystems and putting yeah. people in that position and getting that outcome myself. Yeah. You don't have to do it. As you know, you don't have to do it. It just doesn't work that way. You burn out. Now it's, it, you know, it starts with their emotional side of the brain because every decision starts with your emotional side of the brain. And then you justify that with logic where it has to make sense. Right. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. so there's, there's two types of, of ways that salespeople have been really trained to do that. Now the 99% have been trained to, like we talked about, externally motivate them. Mm-hmm. That means pushy, high mm-hmm. pressure, at, you know, asking them questions that force them to say yes. Mm-hmm. Now, most consumers know what you're doing by this time, right? Like you, you're forcing them to say yes, they feel trapped. And as you know, they stay surface level when you do that, right? And they still, they'll say yes 17 times. And then at the end still say, I want to think it over. Or you get, don't have the money. you get your, you get as you said seventeen yeses in a row when it's all softball questions. Doesn't this sound great? Uh, yet the moment you ask them the real question, would you like to get started or or something along those lines? Here comes the first no, uh, or here comes the first let me think about it, or words to that effect. In effect, you didn't have an honest conversation for the last seventeen questions. It was surface level. It was polite. Now the real conversation starts because if they don't stop being polite, they're gonna have to hand their credit card over, and they've already decided they don't want to do that. Uh, so I'm all about having honest conversations, killing elephants in the room as early as possible, yeah. dropping their defenses, giving yeah. them permission to tell you no. Um, yeah. and when you do that, they don't see you as a threat anymore. They don't see you as a typical salesperson anymore. Yeah. Much more they likely to buy from you later in the call. They trust you. Yeah, they trust you. That the trust is where the sales mate, right? Like if they trust you, that's where the sales mate. Now trust, wh- what we mean by trust is they trust that you can get them the best result, right? Yep. Um, you, you know, going back to, to this, so there's external persuasion that's pushiness, you know, high pressure. Like you said, that wears off when you leave, when you get off the phone, when you get off Zoom, when you get out of their house or out of their office or wherever you sell it, B2B or B2C. And then you get get people that, you know, that buyer's remorse. And mm-hmm. then you have the emotion where it's called internal tension. So you got internal <laughs> tension compared to external pressure. Now, internal tension is caused by the questions you ask and how you use your tongue to get them to emotionally open up and go below the surface, right? So instead of just asking surface level questions, you know, where they're going to give you logical based answers, we want to clarify and probe off those where they feel comfortable enough 
they trust you enough to actually open up and tell you not just the problems, but the root cause of the problems. Mm -hmm. And not just the root cause of the problems, but how the problems are affecting them even personally, right? Mm -hmm. And a lot of people would, you know, when I was in B2B sales, they're like, oh, you know, the prospects here in a fortune 1000 sales, they don't have any emotions. It's all based on numbers and logic. And I'm like, you just don't, uh, the question you should be asking is, I don't know how yet to get yeah. a prospect to want to open up to me and really tell me the truth of what's going on. Once you learn so, that, it's easy. Yeah, it's such a misconception that B2C is the only emotive sale uh, yeah. and B2B is not because they work for a government, well, B2G that would be, but they work for a government or a big corporation. It's just about the numbers on a spreadsheet. Yeah. I always teach people, it's not about what it is. It's yeah. about what it means to them. And on the back of that, how they feel about that. Yeah. Those two second parts are emotion. Um, so objectively, it can be the same thing to you as it is to me, but to you, it changes your world this way. And for me, it's no big deal. We have a different emotional response to what it is, even though objectively it's the same thing. Yeah. So many people miss that. Um, and and so bring it into B2B sales when I bring it into every every sale. Well, yeah, because they're humans. Like because we're, we're trying to suggest that a CEO doesn't have emotions. Like that's a human. Just like <laughs> it doesn't matter. What happens if he gets the decision wrong? And and how does he feel? And how is he perceived if he gets the decision wrong? And on the flip side, if he gets it right, yeah, exactly. you know, where does that take him? How do people see him? How does he feel about how people will see him? Yeah. What does it do to his CV? And how does he feel about that? You know, yeah. how does he feel if he has to let go fifty staff if he gets his decision wrong and it, it smashes the bottom line? Yeah, these things can come up if asked the right way at the right time with the right tonality. Yeah, uh, on the call, hundred percent. Now, if, if you're listening to us or watching us. If you're just asking surface level questions, mm -hmm. then you're not going to trigger them to emotionally want to open up because they know what you're doing. Like mm -hmm. they know that that you're trying to get them to open up. So it's it's all, you know, we'll talk about this. It's all how you use your tone because your tone is how the prospect interprets the intention behind the question. So that's why, you know, when you watch a, a movie, you know, who's your favorite actor or actress? Oh, I'm going to ask you, who's your favorite actor or actress? Who do you got? <laughs> Question without notice. I don't watch movies very much. Uh, gee, that's a question without notice. Um, just in the past, whatever. You watched a movie one time. You're just oh, wow. bored on, the, bored on a Saturday night. Remember the last time I watched a movie? Um, <laughs> I'm not a movie buff. Let, let me hold that thought. Uh, like, who's you like Tom Cruise, George Clooney, any uh, of those guys? All those guys. Um, let's say, uh, let's say. Matthew McConaughey. Who you no. got? You got somebody. Well, the Bourne Identity movies were fun. So let's say. Okay, Jason Bourne. Yeah. Yeah, let's say that actor. I don't even know his yeah. name. Uh, so, yeah, like I was talking to you yesterday, the, the, where I learned tonality wasn't, you know, from a sales trainer because typically it's not really taught in yep. sales. Most sales training programs, they, they, don't, they don't really have a background in human psychology. They don't understand how the, the brain makes decisions, you know, yes or no or left or right or whatever. And so one of the, the first things you learn in, uh, you, you know, in Hollywood or really good acting instructors is you learn how to use your, your face, facial expressions, I kid you not, facial expressions to change mm -hmm. your tonality, to trigger different emotional drivers in the audience's brain that's watching the movie. So like mm -hmm. you, when you're watching Jason Bourne, you might like mm -hmm. action movies, but the reason why you're so drawn to him is when you watch him in those movies you don't view him as Jason Bourne. You view him as the character he's portraying. Now, the yep. reason why you view him as that character is because of his body language, his tonality, and how he's not just sitting there talking like this the whole time through the movie in one monotone voice and his face just sets like this, like a dead face. You tune out like in 30 seconds. But because of his facial expressions and he's using different tones for different parts of the scene and movie, and even in the same uh, sentence he might say, it draws you in and it triggers different emotions with you. So you learn that going to acting school. And that's what I really learned. And that's how I'm like, oh, okay, well, you know, if, if I want, if I want them to open up and let's say they say, well, I, I have a, you know, just have, I have a lot of pressure right now at my job or whatever they, the prospect says, well, hold on pressure. See, confused tone. Mm -hmm. And what that happens in their brain automatically, because my tone was confused, my facial expression signified, I don't understand, is automatically their brain, they don't even know it, but their brain is like, oh, he didn't understand what I meant by that. I need to clarify that more. And mm -hmm. so what that causes them to do is emotionally 
go below the surface and tell you more about what they meant by that. But more importantly, they tell themselves that mm. caused them to relive pain. See what I mean? You yeah. know what I mean? By that. Okay, yeah, yeah. This, yeah. No, I do. I, do. I, I know, I know tonality is a huge thing for you. I, I, I don't go so much into the tonality space because I haven't trained for it. I haven't gone down the deep dive that you no doubt have, but I, 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 I'll give you some really good acting instructors. No kidding. Okay. But well, please do. I'm all ears. We're not but, talking uh, about Karen down the street that charge, no offense, Karen, the charge is $30 an hour. We're, we're talking about big wits, but the my, good. My wife, my wife's name is Karen. I thought you might. Oh, be we're not talking about your wife, Michael. Yes. <laughs> um, but what I was going to say is like, I think where we can draw parallels there is, you know, you're, uh, you're effectively asking them for help and people like helping people uh, if it's in the right context and ask the right way. So I probably don't play the tonality card as strong as you do, but you know, I'll use phrases like, can you help me understand uh, to, to preface the question and soften it. And then, you know, can you help me understand what, what exactly did you mean when you said X, Y, Z? Cause I'm not quite sure. And I don't want to make an assumption. I'll give yeah. the appropriate context. And then that, because I understand the context, they, and it's, they're helping me. Well, you, uh, just, you, just, uh, you just ask okay. that question in a curious tone. That's so right. They're, That's they, right. They're well, interpreting that as he's curious. I need to tell him more. Yeah. I yeah. Remember. They're feeling heard and understood. You know, yeah. they're feeling that you're present on the call. They're feeling that your objective is to understand them, mm. to, you know, help them reach clarity, not necessarily push your agenda. Yeah. Therefore, the defenses are down. And there's a really high chance you'll get an honest answer, if not initially with a bit of, you know, pushback and stress testing and expanding and poking and whatnot. Yeah. But once the truth emerges, you can see where you go to from there. Yeah, um, I, I totally agree. Let's talk about uh, a concept we were talking about yesterday. I think that everybody will really enjoy. Um, you talk a lot about, we talk a lot about this, that, you know, a lot of times in certain context, we're going for the no not mm -hmm. the yes tell us what you mean mm -hmm. by that so this whole this is not my I'm, the, I'm not the author of this concept we talked about this sure. yesterday and yeah. that everyone in sales is borrowing and being inspired from and repurposing and reimagining things they've learned in the past i'm no different i tweak it different but, ways yeah yeah exactly you can put your spin on it and you can blend two or three ideas together to make a unique idea but you can see the genesis comes from two or three different other areas yeah so jim camp famously wrote a book called start with a no many years ago and when i found that book you know, a bunch of years ago, that completely changed the way that I sell. You know, prior to that, I was taught by other trainers, not that initial mentor I talked about, but I went on to fitness sales after after liquor yeah. and very much, this is 10, 15 years ago, very much learned positive, keep it moving forward, keep it optimistic, always yeses, no need Get him to say yes 36 times. Yeah. That stuff. Yes, momentum. Before the close, get like 10 yeses in a row and say, do you want to get started? And yeah, hope that's right. a yes. Uh, often it's not. Uh, but anyway... <laughs> But, uh, you know, I, I was looking for answers be, and, and one of the answers I found, I read that book and the Chris Voss book, uh, start with a no simultaneously. Chris Voss actually references Jim Camp. Oh, uh, does he? Yeah. The, 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 uh, never split the difference. That's a really good book. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So those two books really were quite pivotal for me changing my selling style five or so years ago, but the start with a no is all about the concept of no is actually your friend, not your enemy. If you know how to use it. Mm -hmm. And the reason there's lots of reasons why, but I guess the main reason is no is a safe word. Uh, yes, in the context of a sales or business discussion, is often a dangerous word. Yeah. Like if I say like six yeses in a row to you, I'm like, okay, where's, he, where's this going? Now? Is he going to ask for my money in a second? Exactly. Where if you ask the same type of question, but phrase it in a no way, they feel in control and empowered. And a no can still be a yes in the sense that it moves the conversation forward. Um, yeah. So, you know, rather than say, would you like to get started today? You know, if, you know that if you say yes to that, that feels dangerous. Like, oh God, the next step is you ask my credit card. Uh, it feels like a dangerous question in the wrong context. Yeah. Whereas if I said, Jeremy, is there any reason we wouldn't get started today? You might say, well, no, there's no reason. Yeah, yeah right. But it and leads we, to the yes. No yeah. can lead to and a I yes. Go, and then my follow-up, okay, so what would you like to do? Well, I'd like to get started. Yeah. So we got there, but you decided to go there rather than responding to my invitation. So yeah. you feel the author of that decision you yeah. feel empowered. It was safe for you to get there, yet we got to the same destination, but a different way. Exactly. So I completely changed my selling approach on the back of that book yeah. five or seven years ago. And yeah. well, I still to this day sell off the no. Yeah, Any I, I, question, yeah. I'll use a no-based question. It yeah, was just, soft, it. just keep it moving forward. Yeah. No, the stakes are not high. Yeah, yes is fine. Heavy yeah. lifting, I'll always use a no. Well, and I and I love that. Then, well, how, how, do you, how do you want to proceed from here? Where the prospect feels like it's their choice Mm -hmm. you're the facilitator guiding them there 
right? Because mm-hmm. it's not like they don't have problems. They wouldn't be on the call with you if they didn't have problems, right? Mm-hmm. It's not like your solution can't solve their problems. So this is a win-win. We're not, you know, I always, I always, you know, what, what got me into sales training? So I retired in 2017, uh, yeah, first part of 2017, late 2016. And I started seeing all these ads on Facebook and IG. And there was like, you know, you know, uh, go through the numbers, like hustle muscle. And like, you, you know, you gotta, you know, get 150 no's to get that one. Yes. You're gonna have tough skin and, and re- you go through rejection. And I'm like sitting there looking at this stuff and I'm like, man, if I sold that way, I, I would have made like 95% less in my career. Like, who is this guy talking about? Like, what mm-hmm. what is going on? And I saw all these salespeople buy into that way of thinking. And I'm like, they're going to burn out. Even if they get to, let's say, six figures, that's yep. it. Like, they're not going higher. And they're going to work, you know, 10, 12, 14 hours a day. They're going to work the weekends. Their spouses are going to hate them. Their divorce is just a lot of drama. And it doesn't have to be that way because- yep. Like I said, they have problems that you can solve, right? So what, what are we doing there? You know, what's the missing link? Why are they running the other way? Well, it's a salesperson. Yep. And, I, and I realized like, you know, if you're listening to this, me and Michael, it's not your fault because you were trained that way, but mm-hmm. it is your what? It is your problem. Nobody's yep. going to come save you. You have Therefore, to acquire those skills. But it's your responsibility to fix it if your ambitions are higher than, the, than you're achieving right now. Yeah. And the way I always looked at it, like, if I, if I didn't make a sale, like, you know, cause people that say I could sell anybody, anything. I'm like, yeah, okay. That's why you're broke. It's because mm-hmm. you can't, you can't close everybody. Like you just, you, I don't care how good you are, but I, you know, you know what? We're and both you should, you should, and you you anyway. if, yeah, you're closing, if you're closing everybody, your prices are too low as a start point. Yeah. Uh, and no, no product uh, is right for everybody. Yeah. It's just not. Yeah. I mean, it's ridiculous. And so anytime I hear that, I'm like, Oh my God. Okay. That's yeah. yeah okay. Whatever. Anyway, so it's just, it's just this concept is like, you know, selling is not, if you want to be a, a top 1% uh, earner in your industry, you got to view selling as collaborative. It's mm-hmm. like you working with the prospect to help them find and solve problems they didn't realize they had. You start taking that mentality, it comes across in your body language, it comes across in your tonality. People start to view you differently. Whereas most sales people have been taught that it's adversarial, you against the prospect, you know, trying to win them over, trying to manipulate them, pressure them so you can make money. And as you know, Michael, the prospect picks up on that very quickly. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, do we really think it's the first sales interaction they've ever been on? Uh, they've yeah. been on many. You know, yeah. there's a reason There's a reason why if you and I walk into a retail store right now yeah. and the retail assistant greets us at the door and says, hello, gentlemen, can I help you? We're automatically both going to say, no, thanks, just looking. It's a... You know, we're given permission to lie to salespeople. Why? Because it keeps us safe and people want to yeah. stay safe. You know, that both know that if we say, yes, we're here to buy some shoes, we're going to get smothered. We're going to lose control of the interaction. We might get pushed, manipulated, pressured. I don't know. We don't feel in control and therefore we don't feel safe. So we're up against that on every sales call. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it's important that as a start point, you don't yeah. act and behave and sound and feel like a typical salesperson who's only self-interested in getting the money out of your pocket at any cost. Yeah. Uh, with them rather than against them hence give them permission to tell you no which ties in with the book i said earlier yeah put those things and do it right and there's a high chance that defenses will come down you can actually have an honest conversation Uh, and then on the back of that there's a high chance that if where they're at and where they want to go aligns with what you do yeah they'll probably ask to buy from you in a few moments yeah 100 it's not like it i mean if they're walking into an open house to look at a home or if they're walking into a furniture store to look at furniture if they're walking into a car dealership I mean, they're walking in. Obviously, they're looking for something. They just wouldn't waste their, oh, let's just go randomly walk around a furniture store because we're so bored, right? But mm-hmm. like you said, that's a triggered reaction based on the salesperson's tone and usually how quick they say that. And it's just a it's a reaction that they're, oh, just looking, right? It's like the instinctual part of your brain. It's like a defensive mechanism. You yep. know, it's like the defensive mechanism goes up. So what I would do in that situation is I would... You know, we teach a lot of this to car dealerships and and retail and furniture and all that kind of stuff, real estate, the houses. You know, I'm going to tell them the objection so they don't ever say it. I'm going to bring up the objection at the beginning and I'm going to try to prevent the objection. So when they walk in, let's say if I'm selling a furniture or a car dealership, hey, you know, welcome into the dealership today. Are you guys out just kind of looking around? 
I would have repeat that too. I'm like, yeah, yeah, we're, yeah, we're out here. Oh, and do you know what you're, do you know what you're looking for? You know, and I'm right into it because you know, you know how many times you walk into a car dealership and they say that and you're like, just looking. And then it's like done. Yep. It's like, it's over. Right. So I'm going to feed the objection to them just to give it to, so they can't say to me, then go right into my first connection questions. I love that, man. Well, it, it ties in with the concept that Chris Voss talks about being heard and understood. You're hearing and under, or they're feeling heard and understood before they've ever opened their mouth because you've articulated that it's clear that you guys are just looking and you've said that to them. So automatically like, oh, this guy gets me. And then yeah. you've offered a, a further opportunity to engage beyond that. And they yeah. might just say yes, because their defenses have dropped because they're heard and understood. Yeah. Now the conversation starts as opposed to an uncomfortable silence whilst yeah, it's awkward because they're just looking. Yeah, And two minutes later, you've got to go over and say, are you guys okay? Yeah. Uh, oh gosh, all, I hate that. Very awkward. All it's very so awkward. awkward. It's <laughs> so bad. It's and this, you know, to you and me, this sound, this stuff sounds like you know second nature. But for a lot of salespeople, this is like revolutionary. You know, even yep. going for the no. Like, let's say if I'm selling, you know, cybersecurity or or SaaS, and I'm I'm talking with a, a company or a bank or what, and I'm trying to, you know, get a what we call a, a micro commitment to, you know, smaller commitments that lead to the the larger commitment of them buying, you know, what we're selling. And I'm trying to set up a, a second call demo instead of saying, are you open to having demo X, Y, Z or open to have another meeting? Like you said, I'm going to say, are you opposed to, to us setting up a meeting with you to go over X, Y, Z to see if this would help you with ABC? Are you opposed to that? It's hard mm-hmm. for them to say, yes, I'm opposed. They're like, no, no, I'm not opposed. You know, it's yep. like they push back. No, I'm not opposed, you know? Yep. So yeah, I absolutely. Hope- Exactly. You've removed you've removed the negative possibility from the table. So all that's left is the positive possibility. Yeah. Then you just do one or two more questions and they'll probably say, yeah, let's do that. Yeah. And it's again, awesome. they felt in control the whole time. They didn't feel that you yeah. pushed that agenda onto them and strong arm them or pressured them. Now being polite or yeah. didn't want to be confrontational. Yeah. They, of their own free will, came to that conclusion. It's, uh, it's hard for somebody to say, yes, I'm opposed. Like, it's very, very hard. They're like, no, no, I'm not opposed. What do you have? You know, we yeah. do that on cold calling all the time rather than, are you open to having a conversation or I'm with X, Y, Z? Are you opposed to having a conversation around that? No, no. Yeah. What do you got? Well, you know, what's going on? So, all right, good. Okay. Now let's talk about, uh, I wrote down a few questions here that I wanted to go over with you. Um, what is your, because me and you talked about this yesterday and I thought this was an interesting conversation. What are, what are your thoughts about the, in the marketplace of sales training, the the buy or die mentality that's being taught. Yeah, look, that's a big reason why I coach and train people and why I sell the way I do. It's basically the strong visceral reaction in a negative way towards that way of selling and being. So I have done my version of that, never unethical, but definitely manipulated in an emotional sense, like using, you know, certain pressure tactics and, you know, asking questions that back them into a corner and the only way out was basically to say yes like i've, I've done that especially in logical based traps yeah well that was how i was taught you know i thought you said you want to get fit you know i've said silly things like that you know and you could argue that's passive aggressive i've learned my lessons i'm repenting um <laughs> but i know what that life looks like i know what that life is like and that is the whole reason i do what i do so i said to you on yesterday's call my whole mantra in sales and and what i teach Mm-hmm. is the intersection it's got to be effective it doesn't if it doesn't work nothing else matters why are you even doing this so it's exactly. got to work so it's got to be effective so that's one part of the axis the other part is self-preservation and i'm looking at the intersection between those two when i say self-preservation i mean i've got to like who i am and who i become on these calls and how i treat people right. i've got to like how i think they are perceiving and and viewing me yeah. i've got to like the energy that we collectively create together I've got to like what I would perceive someone if they were to observe this, who I respected a third party. I wouldn't want to be, I wouldn't want to lose my status and become a loser that treats people that way. So there's all these things in play. And on the back of all of that, I've got to want to keep coming back for more. If I'm having to become a caricature and sell a certain way that makes me become somebody I despise and don't like who I see in the mirror. If my kids walked in on a sales call, they'd be disappointed in their dad. I I won't keep doing it. I'll do something else. So mm. it's got to be that intersection. It's got to work, but you, I got to feel good about the whole situation that's created and want to come back for more. I have found that it took time, but I've found and created that. And as a result, sale or no sale, I feel good about the interaction because if they don't buy from me, I know exactly why they didn't buy from me. And every now and then I drop the ball because I'm human and we always, we all do, but all of us do 
more often than not, it's because the fit wasn't there for whatever reason. Yeah. They may have liked what we did, but no matter what, no world existed where they could fund it, even if they really, really, really wanted to. It just wasn't possible. And that happens. That's yeah. reality. And the cool uh, thing, the cool thing about what you're talking about is, you know, when the when the prospect is like if I didn't make a sale when I was in the trenches, I knew that they felt I was concerned for them mm-hmm. that because they they we're staying in the status quo. They, the the problems would stay the same. I was concerned for them. So when when they left, I, I can't tell you how many times prospects, both companies or individuals, when I sold B two C or B two B, called back. You know, a month later, three months, well, he, six months. Hey, I I found the funding. Like I can't believe it. I I've got it. And that would have never happened if I tried to kill them. You, you know, and and buy or die. Like you're a loser if you don't buy. Like you you're severed that relationship forever. Do you really do you really think if you put them through a 30 minute objection battle at the end where and it went nowhere and you both basically hung up on each other? Do you really think they want to call you back or recommend you to a friend? You know, no, if change, they never they never want to see you again and, and they shouldn't. Whereas if they feel heard and understood, you collectively both realize that this just can't happen today for whatever reason. Yeah. The door stays open, a pathway towards making it happen in the future still exists. There was respect, there was decency. A, even when things change, they come back to you. B, the questions that you gave them may cause them to ponder over a period of time. They come to different realizations in the past, you know, after a sleepless night where they think about that one question that changed everything that you asked them. Yeah. Um, or they recommend a friend because they know what's waiting for them at the end of a call, you know, a decent person who have an honest conversation with them. And if it makes sense, we do something together. And if it doesn't, we part the call as friends. I mean, that's that's the world I want to exist in. That's the world I exist in now. I know the other world. I never want to go back. Well, I, the other world, you know, you know, I, I, I've, you you probably read this before, but I, I read this a few months back that, and, and I've known this for a long time, that sales, I mean, it's I think it's the first or second uh, biggest, um, y- you know, employment sector that so many people leave. You mm. know, I, th- I think pl- being a police officer and a salesperson has the highest turnover. And why does it have such high turnover? Exactly the reason you just said. Salespeople go in there buy or die adversarial you against the prospect trying to manipulate them win them over and you walk out of each sales conversation feeling like you just went to a a 12 rounds of a boxing match and eventually psychologically as a human being you will wear out and that's why so many salespeople like want to get in sales do decent so they can get into management right so they don't have to go through the emotional trauma or they want to do sales but then they're like i want to leave and go into operations or I want to, they just, they can't take the rejection in the boxing match all day long. It doesn't have to be that way. I, I was in professional sales for almost 18 years as a rep and I never felt, never felt the need to do anything else because the money was amazing. When you learn the right skills, you get to help all these people solve their problems and get where they want to be. I mean, that's an amazing feeling and yep. it's a win-win where you don't really you don't come out of it feeling like a box match. Even if you don't make the sale, I would look at myself like, hey, what did I do wrong? What did I not ask? What did I not mm-hmm. say? Like, I'd always look at myself rather than all oh, the prospects are just broke or, you know, fear-based. You know, I just, eh. even, and But even if they are, they have every right to be. I mean, sure. there's no, there's no um, certification they need to go through in order to become a prospect on a call with you. They're just normal right. people sitting on a call who've got a problem. They think maybe you can help them. I mean, it's up to you to manage the call appropriately, ask the right questions, control the call flow, you know? Um, so even if it's not your fault, you know, yeah. it, it will serve you better to look at it as if it were, analyze closely what you could have done differently, what moment you didn't necessarily do the right thing or ask the question the right way at the right time, yeah. learn from it, get better, Yeah. move on, take those yeah. learnings and move on to the next call. Yeah. And instead of like, feeling like, oh man, you know, I didn't make that sale. I'm not going to make money. I felt bad for the prospect. Mm. Like I felt generally like, ah, man, that sucks for them. Like the problem's going to stay the same. Either they're never going to get what they want. I felt generally bad, but then I just moved on. Nothing I can do for them. I'm just going to move on and help somebody else. If you You take that mentality, selling's easy. Yeah. You can't carry the weight. I mean, there's only so much we can do as well. I mean, we're not saviors at the end of the day. I mean, we can help them have certain realizations. We can help them realize what they need to now do and and help them find the courage and and strength and and impetus to actually do it yeah but at the end of the day it's their journey it's their money it's their consequences it's their pain it's their future it's their dreams not ours and if we're speaking to 10 15 20 people per day 
Yeah. Some of us are. You can't carry the burden of all those that said no, chose to stay in status quo. Same. You'll go into it. Yeah, um, that doesn't align with the self-preservation part I said earlier. So, yes. you know, we talked about um, uh, the, uh, so Socrates earlier. Another thing is the Stoics, you know, being detached from things you can't control. Yeah. You can't ultimately control if you buy from me. I can influence it. But I ultimately don't make the decision you do. It's their decision at the end. That's right. So I'll do all I can to help you realize what needs to be done. And in yeah. many cases, that will be to ask to buy from me. Hopefully lots. Yeah. Um, it won't always be the case. And I'll be at peace. As long as I did everything I could have done and I know why they didn't buy and yeah. ultimately it was outside of my control, the reasons why they didn't buy. If it was my stuff up, I'll learn from that. It'll hurt a little bit, but I'll get better. Exactly. But I won't carry the burden that this person didn't change because I can't. I'll go crazy about it. Nothing you can do about it, right? You you, you feel generally bad that their consequences are going to stay the same, but then you just move on. Hey, you know, nothing I yeah. can do for them. I did my best. I'm moving on to somebody else that I can help. 100%. You have yeah, you have to. Hey, tell us about, um, you know, we talked a little bit about this yesterday. Um, tell us about the concept about being upfront on funds or funding or money or budget they would need rather than just trying to surprise them at the end. Yeah, you and I might differ on this. I'm not sure. I've, I've seen some of your posts where you like- similar. It just depends on like, the industry. Look, I'm all about killing elephants in the room and removing as much resistance as possible. Uh, and I like to kill the elephant rather than wait for them to identify and bring it up. So yeah. you talked earlier about the car dealer example where when they were walking towards you, you know, you thought by chance they're probably just looking. So you yeah. call it out before they do. They feel heard and understood. You get them. Automatically, their defenses drop. They probably trust you a little bit more. Your follow-up question actually goes somewhere now. And now you're having a conversation with them. Sure. So it's very much from that whole spirit or that whole concept. Yeah, so exactly. when we're prospects, and we are prospects all the time, we buy things all the time. Mm -hmm. um, you know, very rarely is price not in the conversation early. There are exceptions, but yeah. very rarely is it not in the conversation early. It's a reality when you make a purchasing decision. Like I know Sure, they know it's going to cost something, right? Yeah. I don't necessarily get into the absolute specifics. It's going to cost you $8,300, sure. yeah. but I might talk ballpark, uh, you know, uh, and there's a lot of reasons for that. Um, firstly, as a prospect, I want to know that. And there's an art in how you do it, which I would need to spend a bit of time to walk you through all the steps and how I particularly do it. Sure. But I'll, I'll talk about the why behind it. Yeah. By doing it, I felt, I've found that it builds goodwill. It builds trust. Uh, and yes, it can trigger resistance it can trigger the start of an objection but yeah. guess what that objection was probably not definitely but probably going to come up later anyway sure and i would rather deal with an objection at the sure. start of a call than at minute 55 after i've price presented you and tried to close you and i hear for the very first time that you're totally bloke and don't have a credit card i would rather oh, have sure. a conversation in a five and i can still overcome your objection if it's overcomable yeah. but we bring it nice and early and yeah. if we can't you know like if it's insurmountable which it can be sure Falls over in 10 minutes with dignity. The door stays open. You know, I know I couldn't get them no matter what because no world existed where they could fund this. No world, even if sure. I loved it, out of 10. Oh, yeah. I, couldn't I think we're on the same. I think we're on the same page with that. Like uh, what I would prescribe is like there's certain for every industry. Everybody knows there's certain things a prospect says or mm -hmm. ask that can mm -hmm. trigger a red flag that maybe they don't have the funds or funding or they can't get it. So yep. if you hear those. We definitely want to qualify quick because you're right. You don't want to waste time. We yep. see a lot of salespeople, you know, let's just even talk on the B2B side. You know, they'll have like a 12 month sales cycle. And in month seven, they find out that the company has no budget until another year or they're in another contract and they can't even talk to them for two more years. And I'm like, you just wasted six months of your time. When yep. you could have found out what type of funding they were going to put in so they could get X, Y, Z result. Those yep. are type of questions. Now, do I want to like get on a call, you know, in the first couple of minutes and say, hey, what type of, you know, if there's no red flags and, mm -hmm. and everything's going good and just automatically say, hey, you know, it's going to cost this. Do you have it? Sometimes mm -hmm. that's a little bit dangerous because with most prospects, they don't even know really what their real problems are when you first start talking to them. So yep. how do they know what their budget needs to be if they don't even know what their real problems are yet? But like yep. I said, it just there's no straight jacket interpretation of that it yep. depends on what the prospect, you know, we talk about in NEPQ, listen to what the prospect means, not just what they're saying to you. Those mm -hmm. are two different things, right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. if I ask a, a prospect, 
you know, about funding. They're like, well, you know, we'll have to see what we can do. And in their tone is like that. That means to me that they're not quite sure they can get the fund. So I need to dive deep into more of that. But if they're like, no, 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 we, we definitely can get funding. That means something completely different, you know. So there's, it's hard to have a straight jacket interpretation. Yeah, but there's a lot of variables in play. So it's not just about price or budget or investment, whatever you want to call it. Um, it's it's beyond that as well. It's about decision making, um, process, timelines. I want to know all these things early in the conversation to avoid the exact situation you just said a moment ago. Yeah. You know, six months into a long term negotiation, you find out they're years away from being ready. So. Yeah. I, you know, there's a methodology in how I do it. I don't just say it's 10 grand. What do you of think? Course, you know, yeah. Yeah, yeah, of I course. Yeah. Yeah. That, that wouldn't work. We all know that. Yeah. A lot of, uh, a lot in the how component. Yeah. Um, but to me, I want to know as early as possible what they can, could, would do yeah. if they find what they're looking for. Of course. Uh, so there's a bunch of questions I use to identify that and then stress test that, meaning push back to make sure I really have the truth or, or expand on the answer to have a full picture rather than a micro picture. Yeah. Um, but I want to get that as early as possible Yeah. and then build off that. And I don't mind if it triggers some sort of resistance because yeah. as I said earlier, I would rather have a conversation about objections and possibilities early rather than at the very end or six months into a negotiation. Sales people waste so much time. That's that's their biggest yeah. hindrance is that waste all this time of prospects who can never get the funding, whereas they could be talking to prospects that could. We see yep. that in every industry because, yep. you know, even if a prospect says, and this is typically a triggered reaction, it's mm. not like this should ever happen that much. But if you ask a couple of questions, let's say, and they're like, well, hey, can you just can you just tell me how much it's going to cost on tape if I'm interested? That's typically triggered based on your tonality that triggers that reaction, as yep. you know. But yep. you've got really one of three choices at that point. If you just blurt, well, it's going to cost this because yep. there's a lot of industries that quite literally you don't know what it's going to cost because you don't know their situation. Like you literally do not know what it costs. Like if I'm selling life insurance, I don't know what it's going to cost them in the first two minutes. If I don't know their age, if I don't mm -hmm. know their health conditions, if I, you know, if I don't know all these things, I, I don't know. Now, if I'm just selling a, let's say a training program that teaches people like you talked about how to lose weight and it's one price, one product, that's a different situation, right? Cause you know, yep. But if yep. I, I just, I got one of three choices, if they just automatically, hey, just tell me how much it's going to cost to have my interested, I can just blurt out the price. It's going to be 10 grand. And mm -hmm. as you know, if you just say it like that, everybody, even if they can get the funds, we're like, oh, that's too expensive most of the time. Mm -hmm. Or mm -hmm. I can try to sweep it underneath the rug. I see a lot of salespeople that like try to ignore it. They're like, mm -hmm. oh, uh, yeah, yeah, we got some options, but I, I don't even know if I can help. Let me ask you. And most prospects see right through that, especially yep. if they're A-types. They'll be like, well, hey, just tell me. Yep. Or I can answer it indirectly where it makes sense why I'm asking questions. And once again, yep. it depends on the industry, right? Yep. Yep. So same thing, you know, like I said, if I sold uh, health insurance, oh yeah, for sure. We'll go through all, all of that. I mean, it's really all going to depend on like your age, you know, your health conditions, the plan that United uh, has you on now and kind of what the deductibles are. And once I understand all those different details, I can go through all the different options we have for our clients. Would that help you? Yes. Mm -hmm. No, it wouldn't help me. But in that context, in that setting, I don't know what it's going to cost. I have to know those things legitly before I yep. would know. You know, so that third option he gave then ties in with the concept of being heard and understood, which, as we said earlier, is 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 fundamentally important and lowers their defenses. I would add another one. I mean, they're all fine. What you said's fine, and your third one was a good example. I'd add another way you could handle that too. I would, in an in the right way, there's a particular yeah. way you ask this, yeah. but I would actually try to understand why they're asking about price so early on the call, yeah. and that through, that will have them reveal. Firstly. Firstly, it can do a lot of things. Their answer can do a lot of things. It can make the issue go away because it was just a trigger response from there. Maybe they were just flexing, trying to establish control. Maybe you garnered their respect by the way you handled that question and reversed it back onto them. Secondly, it may actually reveal that they have a limitation of 10K and they're like hard and fast. If this is over 10K, nothing else matters. Like my budget tops out of 10K. We don't even speak if it's beyond that. Now, that can then be fleshed out. And then if you are over 10K, well, then there's a way you can handle it. There's a way they can get the funds, yeah. If but you build but the bottom line is, I don't know why they're asking this question. And I won't continue and I won't answer it until I understand why they're asking it. So yeah. I'm going to focus on understanding that why it is they're bringing this up so early on. Well, they've every right to. I'm not saying you can't. They can do what they want. They can buy how they want. But I'm going to focus on understanding why they are asking me that question right now. Okay. What's when I understand the it, then I, will, then I will decide what my next step is. 
Yeah. Maybe then I will reveal the price because it's the only step I've got. Maybe the question disappeared. Yeah. Um, or maybe we've agreed that price isn't that important and it can wait till later on once we understand them more. I don't know. But yeah, true. That's yeah, and it's, all, it's all it's all based on the context, right? Because if they're like really in your face and their tone yeah. is like really aggressive, yes. that's going to be a different way you answer and react to that compared to if they're just like, hey, can you tell me what the price is? Completely different because if they're like, hey, can you tell me how much it's going to cost? And they're in that type of tone. Oh, for sure. We've got a lot of different options. Now, did you did you ask that for a reason? Just so I understand. Yeah, the yep. reason why I should see clarifying question, right? Yep. I agree with you 100%. Yep. I think yep. me and you were more on the same page on that. That's good. I, think uh, so. I, I saw you uh, respond to one of my posts one day, uh, time and I, I never like I never respond back to posts because, you know, and you'll know this when as your company gets bigger and you grow and you've got more people, you want to write your own post, you want to do these things, but you just, you don't have time, you know, yeah. and we've, we've got like 163 employees now or something like that. And we've got like, uh, we got like six copywriters and they're writing stuff. And sometimes they, you know, they write it differently because you can't control and you can't mm -hmm. read everything that's out there. If you do, you're going to work 35 hours a day. You'll find this out quick. It takes a couple of years, but you can't control everything that's written. And sometimes I'll see something written. I'm like, oh my God. Like they just left out this whole part behind it. And now it seems stupid, but you just, you just have to just go on with it. You know, what are you going to yeah, do? We had a, we had a fun exchange, but yeah, look, it's good. It, it was all, it was as anytime I present an alternative position or a critique yeah. and I invite it my way as well. And I get it my way as well. When I put something out there, I, it's always about the position. It's never about the person. Uh, and I will always articulate the how and why I see it differently. And I welcome sure. a response that it's may always change. Yeah, we, we always learn from each other, right? It's so like, I, you know, best I'm idea. A person, I agree with you. I'm a person that like knows I don't know everything. Mm -hmm. I don't know everything. If you're a salesperson listening or a business owner and you feel you know everything about sales and persuasion, you're stuck. You're never yeah. going to make more money because till my dying day, whatever day that is, if I'm in my 80s or five years from now, whenever that is, I'm going to learn as much as I can because I realize in the grand scheme of things, I don't know anything. And when you mm -hmm. take that approach that like, hey, I, I know this, this, and this, but like, you know, things change. And and I might see what Michael says, I'm like, that's a really good idea. And I might tweak it a little bit. And you might see what I say, and like, I really like that. But for my industry, I need to say this. That's when yep. we all grow and we get better. I'm, I'm sure you're going to say the same thing, but so many positions I have now are so different to how they were five, 10 years ago. Oh, yeah. Like I used to sell off a yes. I now sell off a no. Yes. You know, so I was close to the idea of ever being challenged or critiqued or shown there was a different way. I would be the loser, not the person making the, uh, the comment. I don't want to be a loser. I want to be a winner. So I'm going to stay humble. I'm going to stay open-minded. I'm going to keep self-correcting, yeah. uh, welcome critiques of my positions and yeah. make right maybe they're not i don't know let's have a conversation and, and, and it's so true a lot of times if somebody's critiquing a post they don't really understand the context of that because if you're posting all the time unless you're just writing it out all yourself all the time which as you grow will be impossible for you to do they don't understand the context they don't understand where you're coming from you might mm -hmm. come from a perspective of oh i mainly train home improvement reps or i mainly train b2b reps and they're coming from a concept of i sell fitness that doesn't make any sense and mm -hmm. so it's a trigger reaction, but it's all about, it's all about, uh, I always say this, uh, you know, the, have you ever read the book, The Art of War? No, I'm familiar with it, but I haven't read it's it. It's a good book. Yeah. So, so yeah. I, I always tell everybody in my company, I'm like, there's 8 billion people. Seven level cannot train everybody. Mm -hmm. I would rather make allies with other sales trainers that have similar belief systems and principles. Now they might be different because everybody's different. Nobody's a hundred percent the same. Oops. That's that's good. I'd rather create allies and I might not agree with everything they say because I just don't understand it. I don't understand where they're coming from. Doesn't mean that they're right or wrong. But also but your they lived just, experience they have a been, different view. Yeah. Your lived experience and what's worked for you is different to the other person who had a different lived experience. Yeah. That can be right. Yeah, like there are subjective truths. It's my truth. You know, it might not be the objective yeah. of the truth, but it's my truth. It's what I believe. It's what serves me. Yeah. So I'll keep. I totally agree, man. Hey, listen, I love this conversation. I know you got a hard stop. I got a hard stop too. Where, where can uh, you know, where can people go to find out more about you and and what you do in like the coaching space, high ticket space, all that stuff? You know, we 
you know, we're always looking for allies, other trainers that have very similar principles as we do. Where can they go to find out more about you, Mike? Yeah, thank you. And I've enjoyed the conversation too. So good to good to connect here. We're, we're uh, going to have more. We'll do, we'll have you come you. in here to our podcast studio, right? It's getting built. Look forward, right? Look forward to it. You're about a two hour flight away. So not too far from Guatemala. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. True Sales Pro is, is the name of my coaching company, one-on-one -on -one training and group training. Um, the word true is in there for a reason. Everything yeah. I do is a truth. Uh, that's my yeah. first principle. Yeah. Um, TrueSalesPro.com. You can find me there. Michael James Dunleavy on Facebook. Post every day on Facebook, so that's probably a good start point. I haven't really got into LinkedIn yet. I need to do that. Um, Gotta get you yeah. on IG making reels every day. day. Gotta yeah, get True you Sales on. Pro Instagram just just went live today, so True Sales Pro okay. Instagram as well. Yeah, why don't you uh, send us your handle for your IG? Let's have them start following you on IG and Facebook and all that stuff. Uh, love to have you back on for sure. It's been a pleasure. Love to to okay. work with allies that have very similar principles as we do and beliefs and and changing how the way sales is perceived in society right? Yep. It, it takes a, it takes an effort of all of us to do that, uh, to kind of get away from the old, you know, dinosaur ages of boiler room selling techniques and surface level stuff that does the prospects no good. So it's been a pleasure to, we, to have we, we've got a lot of work to do because the perception of the salesperson is generally speaking pretty low out there and deserved, but there are exceptions. And, you know, I think your mission similar to mine to make a lot more exceptions and 100%. eventually flip the perception completely. Yeah. Now in the comments, let us know if we should have Michael back on the show. I'm assuming that almost every one of you going to say that. And then let us know if you want to have us have him speak at our sales con event. That will be later, about, about a year from now. We're going to have our first in-person sales con event. We'll have a few thousand people there. We're going to bring in about six or seven different sales trainers along with us and our staff. Let us know in the comments if you want to have Michael come to speak, because I think he would be good for that. And if you guys want to start learning more about the new model of selling as well, welcome to go to barnesandnoble.com. Uh, one of our best sellers, the new model of selling, selling to an unsellable generation. My good friend, Jerry Acuff, owns a large uh, sales consulting firm on the East Coast. Good book. If you want to learn tactical skills, of course, follow Michael. And you're always welcome to join our free Facebook group, one of those, salesrevolution.pro. Uh, got about 102,000 in there or so. Those things can grow fast, Michael. Right. I know you probably got a face. You got a Facebook group too. You start one. Yeah. I started about four months ago, about 1200 people in there already. It, it so. takes a while. Hey man, we started ours. That one has 102,000 people. And I think we started that less than three years ago. It it can grow, you know, it grows fast. It's growing. I'm, not, I'm far from your numbers, but we'll see where hey, we land. Yeah. We, we were not very far off from you probably after our first three or four months either. So it takes a while, man. Yeah. So you're doing good. You got good content. You got good training. You get results. People. I always say, it's like Steve Martin. You become so good, so great that they can't ignore you. You do that, people will come, 100%. All we'll right, Michael, you. pleasure. See you pleasure. soon. Thanks, Thank everybody. You.